Hi everybody, it's good to be with you at conference and I hope you've had two great days. We're into our last day and I'm going to be looking at, with Trevor Murphy, the two of us are working in this session together, I'm going to be looking at loving family and Trev's going to be looking at loving community. And I'm actually quite excited about sharing some things with you that I can, I've gleaned over the years and that have happened in my family and I hope they're going to help you. Because God actually is all about family. And in Genesis, right there in the first chapter, we get a picture of God's heart for family and God's heart for Adam and Eve. And what took place gives us an understanding of how God sees family and how important it is. In Genesis 1, 27 to 29, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has, <coughs> excuse me, fruit uh, with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So we get this picture right at the beginning of what God was doing with Adam and Eve. And these are the things that I think uh, this verse and a few verses around this say to us about family. We see that God creates man in his own image. He gives them identity straight away. There's a sense of family identity. For Adam and Eve, they identify with being made in the image of God. He gives them fruitfulness and that speaks of increase. So as a father, God wants increase. And isn't that what we want for our families? He gives responsibility and that talks about rulership and authority. And I think anyone who's worth their salt as a parent, as a father, wants to see their kids take on authority and take on rulership in the right way. And then he gives abundant produce, which talks about opportunity. God intends for us to pass on and to create opportunity for those that are in our family. And then he, not in these verses, but we, we know that, that God gets Adam to name the animals. And so we have this creative expression that God gives to Adam right at the very beginning. He could have named the animals, but he gave Adam the opportunity to do that. And we know that God walked in the cool of the afternoon with Adam and Eve. There's intimacy in the relationship. So all of these things, I think, give us a picture of how God sees family. Identity, increase, rulership, authority, opportunity, creative expression, and intimacy. These are the things that God has instilled in the life of family right from the beginning. So I want to begin by talking about uh, our relationship with our spouse. Now, of course, my spouse is, is my wife, Rose, and um, we've had a, a fantastic marriage and a great relationship. It hasn't been perfect, but it's been fantastic. It's, it is and still is today. And I want to read this verse uh, to you. You know it so well, but it says a lot. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, that verse is mentioned four times in Scripture, three times in the New Testament. Of course, here in Genesis 2, in Matthew, in Mark, and in, in Ephesians uh, chapter 5. So I reckon that has something to say about how important the relationship is between husband and wife and between um, you and your spouse. It's essential for God's order in relationships that we get this right. And you know what? I see so many people get this wrong um, because the important thing is that we love our spouses. I'm going to talk about me. It's important that I love my wife. If I love my children more than my wife, I get it out of order. If I give more respect to my parents than I do to my wife, I get it out of order as well. And yet I see so many people focus too much on their kids and not enough on their relationship with their wife or focus too much respect to their parents, which I believe is important, but 
um, place too much respect towards their parents over their spouse, over their wife. And when you get it out of balance, it has a ring of somehow being a good thing. But when you get it out of balance, you get it out of God's order. And it actually doesn't work. And it actually causes problems in the family. And one of the things that Rose and I decided right at the very beginning of our marriage and our relationship, even before we had kids, that the, relate, the number one relationship on earth was going to be between us two. If we got it in God's order and we loved each other the way God wanted us to, according to becoming one flesh and working together as a unit, then those other relationships, the relationships with our kids, and our relationship with our parents would fall into line and would work according to the way God had intended. And I know the church that I came into, that was a major focus. One of the things we we learned to do was um, give priority to each other. And we had to learn about our own needs and and the needs of our spouse. And uh, one of the great tools that we used was the, the love languages. And it was many years ago. I think it's still important today. But it was such a powerful tool in our lives. Of course, the five love languages are words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts. Now, Rose is a quality time person. Now, she reckons she's actually changed a little bit and the others have become important. But in those early days, it was really important for her that we had quality time together. And yet I was an acts of service person. And one of the things that uh, helped me understand that was back in the day, we bought our first house and it was a crummy little 10 square house, which is pretty small. I don't know what square meterage that would be today, but um, that house needed a lot of work. So on weekends, I would be working on the house. Uh, I remember painting the outside. I had to burn off all this really bad paint and start again and replace weatherboards and do all sorts of stuff. And so on a Saturday, I'd be working on the house. And it used to really get, I used to get really annoyed that I would be working outside. I didn't know what Rose was doing inside. I'm thinking in my head that she's laying on the couch. Now she wasn't. She was doing other stuff. And I'd be working out there and if she didn't bring me out a cup of tea at morning tea time or whatever, I would just get so stirred up. Um, It was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous when I look back on it. But Rose learnt that if she brought me out some morning tea and when lunchtime was there, we had lunch together and then she brought me out something in the afternoon, I would work away absolutely happily. No problem, acts of service. When you do something practical for me, that, that is something that, that says you love me and you appreciate me. She learnt that and I learnt that I could not take our time together for granted and I needed to give her quality time because that spoke to her. And what we did is we never allowed, so we learnt to understand each other, but we never allowed our relationship with our kids to get out of order and get in the way and give them priority or allow them to manipulate us in certain ways against one another. We just never allowed that to happen. Our kids learnt that that was not on. And we kept the, I believe we've kept the balance right in our relationship. We learn to um, love each other first above all others. Doesn't mean we don't love other people and our kids and our parents, but we loved each other first. And that worked in God's, in God's order and it helped us set our family up. Now, the second relationship, obviously, is your children. And um, your kids need to know that you have a genuine faith. Let me say this. They watch what goes on in your home. If they see mum and dad loving each other, then that gives them security. And I remember because Rose and I didn't have a lot of fights. We had some disagreements. Uh, Of course we did. And there were, you know, there were, you know, passionate disagreements at times. But by the time our kids came along, we were good at keeping those things 
um, between the two of us and, and, it, and our kids hardly knew that, that we would maybe be disagreeing over something. And I remember one time we had a bit of a stand-up argument and the kids were in another part of the house and uh, one of our girls uh, heard us arguing and she came out and said, Mummy and Daddy, are you, going to, are you going to split up? It was like to her, hearing us uh, arguing was not something that she had been used to and she immediately went to a bad place because she hadn't heard that sort of thing before. And it's important that, we, that our kids see us loving our spouse, loving a wife, loving our husband, expressing that love. And one of the things that we also um, made really important in our lives was, this is before I was a pastor, was that we loved church. We loved our leaders. We loved our pastors. I tell this to people all the time. Kids, they don't know the difference between God, church, and pastor. As they're growing up, they see them all the same. They all merge into each other. And I don't actually remember us ever being taught this, but we just worked it out that when you honour God and when you honour the church you're a part of and when you honour your leaders, your pastors, and our kids never heard us speak an ill word about our pastors and once we became pastors about our leaders, they, they thought that we had this perfect church as they were growing up. Not that we did, and not that there's any perfect church, but what they understood and what they got from our relationship and our expression of our faith was, church was a great place. Other Christian leaders are great people. And so they grew up in this environment where they just saw God being positive in their lives. Now, we've got three kids and we've got two that are serving in the church. We've got a, another one of our children that has a relationship with God, loves God, but is not necessarily serving in the church today. Um, we're obviously in prayer and we believe that will happen. Um, but they have a genuine faith in God. Every major decision is prayed about. And uh, I'm rung up and said, can you pray about this, Dad? And so there was there was always this positive attitude in our lives and our attitude towards church, our attitude towards our, our expression of faith in our home and our love for one another. And that created an environment where our kids grew up and had a po have a positive image about God and relationship with God, have a positive understanding of what church is. And I see so many people that have a genuine faith in Christ, but are bagging this, bagging that, saying negative things about other leaders and so on. And I see those kids today not following Christ and, and getting things wrong. And I think that very basic thing is so powerful in the lives of children as they grow up in the life of the church. Now, for our kids, uh, youth ministry was important and a priority. And I'm a pastor, so everyone's going to say, that's what it should be. Now, I believed in that way before I was a pastor. And one of the, one of the, a really powerful story that speaks to me is that we went through, like most churches do, we went through a period where our youth ministry was maybe not the best youth ministry in town and it had its struggles. And there was a youth ministry down the road from where we are right now, and that youth ministry had this spectacular leader. Uh, this leader could preach really well, could speak really well, could sing and lead worship. It was like superstar youth leader. And that youth ministry just started sucking kids in from not only our church, but other churches around the area, and built this really big youth ministry. And we were under pressure to even let our kids go. But we sat down with our kids and said, you know what? Even though some of your friends are going off to that youth ministry, we believe in supporting our own church and we believe in supporting our youth leaders. They're turning up to lead you and 
we as a family, we've made a decision that our family will support our youth ministry. Now, what happened in time was this. That youth ministry for two years just powered ahead. But then one of the bigger churches in town recruited that youth leader and, and he decided to go, bigger church, better offer, all of that stuff. And he took basically the youth leadership team from this church around here and took it to another part of the city and set up the youth ministry in a bigger church or enhanced the youth ministry of that bigger church. That youth ministry collapsed from a couple of hundred kids down to eight kids that were meeting in the pastor's office. And my, one of my daughters uh, turned up at a party with her friends and one of the kids that was still in that youth ministry down to the eight was there. And he, she said, oh, how are you going? And he just started telling this tale of woe about how bad it was that they'd had hundreds of kids and now they were meeting in the, the, the pastor's office. And my daughter said to him, you know what? Remember when you had the couple of hundred kids and it was just awesome? We had a handful of kids. But you know what we did? And it was like echoing the words of Rose and I. She said, we supported our youth leaders. We prayed. We turned up. That's what you've got to do now. You've got to turn up and support those youth leaders and help rebuild that youth ministry. She had something to say. Because in the family culture, that's what you do. And I was actually really proud of her when I, when I heard her say those things. She just said it because that's what came out of her. That's, that's what was in her. She was able to say it genuinely. She had something to say in that moment. Instead of saying, oh, I'm really sorry, she had some life to speak into that situation. So these are important things because they carry weight. Then finally, I want to talk about loving parents. Now, my mum, she led me to Christ. And I'm so thankful to my mum today for what she did with our family. She was an evangelist. She led her family to Christ and she led her friends to Christ. I did the funeral for one of her friends recently that she'd led to Christ. And she was just, she loved God and she loved people and she shared the gospel and people got saved. It was awesome. My dad, he was a completely different story. He grew up in a home that had no faith that I'm aware of. And the father walked out when he was um, 10 years of age. He was the oldest boy. There were three boys. He had a younger brother who was about three or four years younger than him. And then he had a younger brother who was 10 years younger than him. He was only a baby when the father walked out. And that affected my dad. He, um, he really was uh, hurt and quite damaged by what happened. And so when he came into his relationship with mum and got married, he actually didn't know how to operate within a, a healthy family life. And that led to things that I saw in my home that you know I shouldn't have seen, I shouldn't have experienced. I was never um, you know, hit or abused in any way. He loved me, loved our, my two sisters, but his relationship with his mum was uh, uh, tumultuous, to say the least. And so eventually they, they ended up divorcing when, uh, when I first was married to Rose, and that was after many years of um, many breakups and so on. So my dad, he was a hard man. Uh, from 10 years of age, he had to look after himself, essentially. And he just get, became more and more hardened in his heart. He used to, his number one saying... The big saying he had was, you look after number one first. Well, I became a Christian, and you don't look after number one first. You love your brother, you love your neighbor first. And so we had this clash uh, between the two of us in, in the way we saw life. But what happened was the words that, that are here in Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 1 to 3, I'll read them to you, they became a reality reality to me before I actually knew that they existed. And in Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long on the earth. 
Now, I had never read those verses. I was three months a Christian and uh, I went to Merrick's camp as a, as a young person, 22 years of age. And uh, if you remember Merrick's camp and here in Victoria. And I was at this camp and Pastor Bill was actually the, the, the speaker. And he was doing uh, the Saturday morning. I was sitting in the, in the service. And um, while I was sitting in the service, this is the first time it ever happened to me, the Holy Spirit said to me, tonight you're going to go forward for prayer. And so I knew it was God and I felt compelled that that night I was going to go forward for prayer. Now we went to the beach that day and we spent a lovely day at the beach. The whole time I know I'm going forward for prayer, but I have no idea why. So we get to the evening uh, meeting and Bill speaks on um, the fifth column. And I don't remember the detail of it. I remember that's what it was about. And then he gives a call and I know that I'm going to go up. So I get up out of my seat and I start walking down the aisle. As I'm walking towards the front, the Holy Spirit says to me, today you're going to forgive your father. And what I didn't know was I had this, this inner hate and this inner resentment towards my dad because of the things that had happened in our family. And I got to the front of, of the line and there were just... a a number of youth leaders and young leaders that were praying for people. And I came up to this guy and he said, I'm not going to pray, pray for you. I want you to confess why you're here. It was so set up by the Holy Spirit. And I just began to weep. I said, I want to forgive my dad. And I started weeping and weeping. I'm hanging onto his shoulders. He's holding me up. I've got tears literally dripping from my eyes onto the carpet. I could see them fall onto the carpet as I began to weep before God. And I would have been there for 20 minutes and then I went back to my seat and that night I just had this incredible cleansing of my life. Uh, the Holy Spirit did a very deep work in me and I let go of all of the hurt, all of the hate, all of the resentment. And I went home that, after that camp and I told my dad that I loved him and tears welled up in his eyes and welled up in my eyes but that wasn't the end of the story. My dad stayed the same. He's still a hard man. He still was a hard man. And we spent 40 years of relationship from that time on. And some of those days were actually really difficult. He, he, he was a difficult man to relate to. And yet we became the closest of friends. There were numbers of times where if I hadn't have had the grace of God, we would have become estranged but we weren't. God did a, this deep work. And there came a point where I, I just kept, I knew in my spirit that I needed to make sure that my dad was going to be saved. And so I'd share the gospel with him and he just would reject it. And I'd say, dad, I want you to know that if I'm not there, that you know what to do to get your, right, your life right with God. So I'd go through the gospel plan and I'd say, do you understand it? He'd say, yes. I'd say, are you ready to do it? And he'd say, no, I'm not. Well, he got into his 80s and he was suffering kidney failure and he was, the doctor had said to me, the specialist, kidney specialist said, don't bring him back anymore. I can't do anything for him. And I said, how long's he got? He said, probably six to 12 months. Well, it was less than that. It was only a few months later and uh, his his health started to deteriorate and um, he wasn't able to live at home anymore and we managed to find a place for him to move into. And uh, he'd only, I got him in there on the Monday of this new place. It took a lot to convince him to go in. And I, um, this day I was sitting in my office and Rose said, I wasn't feeling well, Rose said, go to the doctor. And I said, no, she said, go to the doctor. So I did. I went to the doctor and when I came out of the doctors, I was near where my dad was now living. So I thought I'll, I'll whip around and see how he's going. As I'm driving up, the phone goes and it's the manager. And the manager says, your dad's not doing well. And I'm thinking he's giving them a hard time. So I said, look, I'm outside. I'll be there in a minute. I came in to his room. There's three nurses there and they're surrounding him. And I looked at him and I knew he was dying. I knew that he was actually he was dying. And the nurse looked up to me and said, 
your father's dying. And I said, I can see that. Can you please leave the room? I want to have a moment with him. So they left. And I said to my dad, I said, dad, you know, I've shared the gospel. I've shared um, that, that God loves you and that you can have a relationship with him. And you know that, don't you? And he nodded. And I said, you know, dad, you're dying. Do you realize that? He said, yes. I said, dad, this is the moment. I said, don't do this because I want you to do it. Don't do it because my sister wants you to do it. You have to do it because you want to get your life right with God. And I said, do you want to do that? He said, yes. So I led him in a prayer of faith. As I started to pray with him, he put his hand up like that and he looked up into the, the corner of the room and I, my feeling is he saw something. And I prayed with him and he repented of his sin. And when I finished... And he asked Jesus into your life. He put his hand down and I said to dad, you don't have to worry anymore. You don't have to be afraid of death. God has accepted you. He's accepted your repentance. You now have a relationship with him. You're going to pass from this life and you're going to pass to be with God. That's what's just happened here. And he nodded his head. You know, within 20 minutes, he couldn't communicate. Two hours later, he passed away and he went to be with Jesus. I thank God for that. And you know what? I learned these words. If you honor your father and mother, it took me 40 years, that things do go well with you. That if you honor God, you honor your wife, your spouse. That you set things up right in your relationship with your kids and get the relationship right. And you honor God and you love God and you love other leaders and you love the church and you respect and love your parents, you know what? Things go well with you. And in the ministry, don't we want that? We want to have healthy relationships. So we, if we do it God's way, then blessing comes. And you know what? It blesses the church. When we get our relationships right, doesn't mean you're going to have perfect marriage, perfect kids, or perfect relationship with your parents. But when you attempt to do it God's way, there is a flow of grace and a blessing. So I want to encourage you with those words. Love your wives, love your kids, love your parents. And, and do, do it God's way. And there's a blessing that flows in your life. There's a blessing that flows in the church. And there's a blessing that is a witness to the outside community. God bless you. And I'm going to hand you over to Trev. God bless. Well, thank you. Um... Always a privilege to share at our CRC conference. Um, so many respected pastors and friends. Um, I feel very honoured to be able to share with you uh, this afternoon. And particularly, um, it's an honour to share a session with Pastor Dan. Um, I've always admired and respected Dan as a good leader. And uh, so it's, it's a privilege to be able to share a session uh, with him this afternoon. Um, heartfelt greetings to... All my CRC Church family, those of you who are over at Seton, um, looks like you're having a great time there. And for those who are in your office or um, just at home and or in hubs around the various regional areas, including those of us here in Narandra, um, we're having a good time together as well. So greetings to everyone from us. Um, it's a great theme as well for the conference, one that I uh, was really pleased to be able to speak to. Through this conference too, we've heard about how loving God and worship are very much connected. Um, I remember some years back in our church, we did a series um, uh, on the theme of um, worship. It was a, a study called Psalmody by a guy called Tom Inglis, and, uh, Tom Ingalls, I think. And, um, and I remember hearing a definition of worship, which I've never forgotten. It was a really helpful definition for me that worship is our response or my response if you like to God's presence now obviously worship is when we gather together we use the term to describe when we're when we're worshiping together we're coming together for worship meaning the whole of the service where we're giving some priority time and focusing on the Lord focusing on his word uh, taking time to sing together and declare to him things that we know to be true about him reminding ourselves of what we love and appreciate about him, the things that are beautiful about him to us. And so that's rightly described as worship. But, you know, if, if worship is our response to God's presence, then 
You know, every day his presence is with us, every moment of every day. That as we go about our life and as we live in community and live in family and all the things that we do, then what happens is um, our worship is a lifestyle. Our worship is our response to his presence, being aware of his presence and responding to his presence every moment of every day. Not some intense thing, but it's that, you know, he can speak to us at any time. We can respond to him at any time because we're mindful and aware of his presence. So loving God and worship, we've seen how they very much tie together and how worship is a lifestyle thing, a part of every part. It's a, it's a part of uh, our whole expression of being a disciple and following uh, following Jesus. Um, spiritual leadership, therefore, and Christian leadership is about leading others to love and to worship, to love God and to know what it is, to be aware of his presence and to respond to his presence every day. Uh, Dan spoke about leading family and so, um, you know, leading, sorry, leading family to love Jesus. And I'm speaking on the theme of uh, leading our communities to love Jesus. And so, um, you know, as a spiritual leader, as a Christian leader, uh, Christian leadership is about leading others into that awareness and that uh, response to the presence of God. Um, you know, if I had to start off with a, a main point, something that I really wanted to emphasise as I begin to share on this theme, then, then I'd make this comment. I'd say that, that if we want to really lead our community into loving uh, Jesus, then we need to lead by our lifestyle of worship. That, um, uh, that, that how we live our life um, is visible to our community. You know, when we're a leader, uh, leadership requires people to follow our leadership, uh, people to see and observe um, things about us that they feel confident to follow. Um, it also involves things that we say, but it's about our lifestyle as well. And it's not about perfection. Like, um, you know, we're not saying, well, people have got to look and see perfection in us. But what we want them to see is we want to see something of, of the relationship with Jesus that we have. Uh, we want them to see something of the expression of the love of Jesus that's woven through every part of our life and to be able to uh, see how that affects um, our response to the situations that we face every day in our life but of course w words are vital as well um, you know sometimes we say well uh, I'm just going to evangelize by showing people my life and we make it as a bit of an excuse not to speak up at times or not to actually share the gospel with words but you know I guess I'm suggesting it's the two things it's our lifestyle um, our lifestyle of worship but it's also to the words that we speak you know verses like how beautiful are the feet of those who uh, who bring good news. Uh, we know that um, the Bible says, Paul says, how can they hear without a preacher? So words are vitally important. I shared with our state pastors earlier in the year when I was speaking at our state conference um, from Ephesians chapter 5, and it's been something I've been thinking about uh, really a lot over the last period of time. And, uh, and it's really where Jesus uh, is giving, or where uh, Paul is basically explaining the relationship between Christ and his church and he's explaining also at the same time the relationship between a husband and his wife. And so um, it's a really beautiful passage in Ephesians 5 but he's talking about how husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. But then he, he describes as he goes through the next few verses that Christ um, cherishes and nourishes the church um, as we are too, as husbands to our wives. But one thing he says that really stands out, he says that um, he washes her with his words. Um, I love that idea. I love the concept of Christ washing the church with his words. So we as, uh, as preachers and pastors and leaders, what we do is we get the opportunity to speak into the church with the words of Christ, to be able to wash the church. We, um, we get to speak into our families and obviously into our relationships by the words that we say, we either contaminate or we wash. And so um, I love the idea of being able to speak to my wife and to wash her with my words, to encourage her, refresh her. I love the idea of speaking to my family and to my children and my words being able to make an impact and to wash. And so we do the same in the community. I love opportunities to speak into our community. If I turn up at a community meeting, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking, well, what do you want me to say? How can I speak into this situation that brings a perspective or brings encouragement or brings 
um, a sense of hope or positivity to whatever it is that we're planning or talking about. And it's not in some arrogant way. It's just understanding that, that, the, that what we're called to, what we've been given authority for, uh, what we have the privilege to do is to actually lead our families, lead our communities by, um, into, into um, uh, loving Jesus and experiencing relationship with Jesus. And so our words are, are vital. I'll just say this about words, and I have uh, spoken about some of this before too, I know, but there's a couple of things that give weight, uh, weight to our words or gives authority to our words. You know, one of those is relationship. Um, the the uh, Rolly Tenkard, I've often uh, mentioned that to you. Rolly Tenkard came and did a men's group uh, at our church, a men's breakfast one time, and he, he just made that comment that our words... Um, or relationship gives weight to our words. I've never forgotten that, that I actually earn the right to speak. And my words, as I speak into my community, you know, they come from the relationship that I build with my community. And of course, also, uh, lifestyle, our lifestyle gives weight to our words. The uh, Bible talks in a, in a couple of places about not being a hypocrite. And so um, it's a strong word, but it's really saying not to let our actions be inconsistent with our words. And so if we want to lead our community, if we want to lead in any environment, but particularly I'm talking today about leading our community to loving Jesus, then what they need to see is our lifestyle of worship, but also that our words are consistent with, um, with how we are living our life. And so relationship gives weight to our words lifestyle gives weight to our words and so i'm just saying words are important and how we speak um, is important how we live our life is really important hey uh, i want to read a passage from romans chapter 12 uh, verses 9 to 18 it's a really great passage and um, i think it speaks to the theme that we're on uh, on today in uh, in the new king james version it basically says at the top of verse 9 it says behave like a christian and we can think of that like behaving like a Christian. Well, here's all the things that you have to try harder to do. But you know what I think this is saying? I think it's saying that as a Christian, this is the thing that will flow out of being a follower of Christ. If we are aware of his presence, if we are responding to his presence, then this is a reflection of the way that we will live. This is a reflection of a lifestyle of worship. Not, okay, tick the boxes, you behave all, all, you know, in all these ways, try harder, come on. But actually, these are the things that flow out of a lifestyle of worship. Our, our relationships, our responses to life situations are all covered in this little passage. So as I read it through, just have a think about how each of these speak of responding to different things that we will face in our life that will be visible to other people. Our relationships, um, when people oppose us, when we face challenges or persecution, they're all listed here. So let me read it to you and let it speak to you as I read this afternoon. Um, it says here, Let love be without hypocrisy. We talked about that already. Let your love be consistent with what you say and, and how you live. So let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honour giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse." Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. I've circled that one. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for the good things in the sight of all men. You know, I said before, people will be watching us, and I suppose there's a bit of a... Uh, attention there because we as Christians we don't live our life basically as men pleasers we don't live our life ruled by what people say about us or the opinions of people or who's watching us in one sense we don't do that because we live by convictions we're interested in what is going to please the Lord rather than you know just doing stuff to please men but at the same time there's there's this aspect whereby we are encouraged to live in a way that those who watch us you know, will actually 
um, benefit from what they see in observing our life. And this verse says that. It says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And so there's this sense whereby, yep, we live by our convictions, we're not ruled by what others think. But there's another sense whereby we are conscious and aware and, we, we, uh, and we're, we're affected by or we, we take note of, if you like, the, the way that other people see us and how they can benefit from what they see in observing our life. Uh, verse 18 then says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So how good is that passage? It talks about how we respond to relationships, how we respond to different trials and different things that come our way, how we sow into community, etc. So let me just talk through a few things that I think are ways that our community is watching us and how they can see us as people that have the presence of God in our life, how we are people that have relationship with Christ, how we are people that are aware of Christ's presence and love him, and how we express that in our lifestyle of worship responding to his presence. The first one I've got, I've just got a few things here, but the first one is the way we relate to one another. I'll just be brief with these, but verse 10 in that passage we just read, it just says, be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. It says to honour one another, giving preference to one another. And then it says also to be of the same mind with one another. They're all things that people observe in the way that we relate to one another. John 13, 35, beautiful verse that many, that many, if not all of you, will know. It says, by this, it says, new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And then it says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved for one another. That actually, if we love one another it, with a kind of love that, that um, reflects uh, the character and the nature of God, I would say if we love one another with agape love, how I describe agape love is it's the love that, uh, that is, uh, flows out of or is based upon the character of the giver, not the deservedness of the receiver. That's the way God loves us. He loves us based on his character, not based upon our deservedness. And he's put his spirit within us so that we can actually love in that same way. We can love with a love that is based upon the character of the giver, not upon the deservedness of the receiver. And when our community see that kind of love that exists um, amongst us, one another that's amongst us, then when they see that, they say, well, there's something there that resembles a follower of Jesus. That actually, when we love each other that way, when we relate to one another that way, the community observes and sees how to follow in a way uh, that they'll be able to also love Jesus and experience relationship and the love of Jesus. Look, the second thing is the way that we relate to the wider Christian community. I know that that's not always easy in every setting. We've been very blessed in our own community that uh, our, the relationship that exists between our church leaders and our church community is primarily uh, very strong and has been for a long time. You know, I know others struggle with that and don't have the same thing. Uh, even amongst Pentecostal leaders within a community, it can be very difficult. We haven't had that problem, but I do understand that it can be difficult. I don't know why it's so good for us, but... We do make a point of praying for new ministers when they're coming to town. We, as a church and as other church leaders, we really pray that whoever comes to town will, will uh, be appointed by God so that we can continue to do the work we do in schools and other things in community that we do. We don't always agree on everything, but we have this oneness, this sense of harmony together. Um, we, uh, we meet on the, the bakery. Those who know Narandra know that the bakery is on a fairly prominent corner in the main street, not too far from where the church is. And so we meet over there uh, at least once a month um, on a Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock and we, we just meet there. We buy some coffee and breakfast or whatever and we just sit there and put a couple of tables together. And from 8 till 9, there's a lot of passing traffic. We don't do a lot of business. We actually pray together and we open the word and have devotion together. We laugh together and share a few stories. Sometimes we'll make decisions about things we want to do together, but then we you know, get others to help us and we plan that later. So we just spend time together. And I love it. As people walk by and they say hello to us all, um, as you know, we're often interrupted by people just passing by all the time stopping to say good day but i love that they see us all sitting there having conversation having fellowship 
praying together. We close our eyes and we just pray together there, right in the middle of the street. And we open the Bible and we share together and we just enjoy each other's presence. When we go to the school functions or different community functions, we always just connect up at some point and have a conversation together and maybe a hug and a handshake and people just see that we get on well together. Again, we're not doing that for show, but it's a genuine love and concern for one another. But people are watching the way that we relate to our wider Christian community. You know, Psalm 133 tells us that where there is unity, the Lord commands a blessing. And I believe that in some ways there is a, uh, we we're the beneficiaries of, of a blessing that comes upon our community because we are deliberate um, and purposeful about the way that we fellowship together with a wider Christian community. The third thing I think that people notice in our community is the way that you relate to those who don't agree. Um, don't agree with you. And, um, you know, this can be a tricky one at times. And I just want to say this, um, just to be brief, I want to say, I, I reckon a, a turning point for me, a, a revolutionary moment for me, was back uh, when Jerry Cook spoke at one of our national conferences many, many years ago. And then he spoke at a state conference later, and I've obviously looked at some of his resources, and I've uh, really appreciated and handed around many copies of his book, Love, Acceptance and Forgiveness, one of the books that's impacted uh, the way I do ministry and the way we function as a church reaching into our community. And he made two statements. One of them, I'm sure you've heard before, is love is to seek another's highest good. That's the definition of love, to seek another's highest good. And then he says, love is not license, which has been a profound thing for me because you know, I used to struggle with the idea of if I love people and encourage them and spend time with them and don't approve of the way they're living or some of the things that they have as values in their life, that actually it would be condoning their behaviour. But when he, when he spoke about that and as I thought about that, it set me free to know that I can love people in my community. I can fellowship people in my community. I can want the best for people in my community, even though some of them, you know, the way they live, the attitudes they have, the way they treat the people around them can be quite obnoxious at times or at least can be sometimes very different to my own value system. But what I've learned is how to relate to those to love and want the best for those around me who don't agree with me or who I don't agree with, who, uh, but yet still be able to um, embrace them and want the best for them. Love is not license was a profound thing. Number four is those who actually more than just don't agree with you, they dislike you and speak against you. And over the years, we've had a little bit of that. Look, um, you know, we've been very fortunate to be well received in our town. But we're also aware that when we shifted from where people were speaking against us and not very favourable towards us to when we actually became quite accepted and even, you might say, uh, reasonably uh, popular or well received within our community, we, we began to talk and say, we have to be careful that we don't let that dictate to how we how we uh, do life and ministry, that we, we appreciate that people respect us and accept us, but we also want to be able to continue to be potent about the things that we do in ministry and not just look to be popular and to be accepted. So how we respond to those who dislike us and speak against us, um, I won't take too long on that, but just to say that is something that is very visible to people and something that will actually help us. How we respond to that will help us to lead people to know and to experience the love of Jesus, to actually be able to love Jesus and experience Jesus' love. The next one I've got here, number five, is the way that we relate to the needy. And again, we can, um, uh, I think it's 1 John 3, sort of uh, 16, says, um, you know, uh, don't, let, don't, don't let us just love in word and tongue, but in deed and in action. You know, if it says if we see our brother in need and we close our heart or our bowels of compassion towards them, how dwells the love of God in you? I mean, it's a real question. If you see need but you're not moved in some way to do something about it, then it's saying, how, how are you really reflecting the love of God? How are you really experiencing the love of God? in your own life and journey. And I know we can't take on every need. We'd be overwhelmed if we took on every need. But we do look to see how we can relate to the needy in our town. Uh, about 18 months ago, we were asked if we would uh, deliver some uh, food uh, from Coles. Uh, it's stuff that was left over or almost out of date or whatever. And it's particularly bread and some fruit and vegetables. Um, and so it's called Second Bite is the program. And we were asked to do that. And I thought, well, 
Will we have the time? You know, how are we going to know who to deliver it to? How are we going to be fair with all those things? Um, and all those questions sort of came into mind. But I felt like it was something that we just needed to, to, to take up, seeing it was on offer. And over the last 18 months, look, I don't have time to tell you today, but I just want to say the doors that that's opened, the opportunities that's given to us. Um, we've never, uh, you know, done any... Uh, promotion about it or sort of bragged about it at all but uh, I had opportunity um, I was at the school doing scripture one day and the deputy and a few other teachers from the school came to me and said can we help you we see you down there picking up the food and delivering it around to families uh, we know you do that can we come and help you and so in recent months they've been a great asset in helping to be able to distribute that around families but at the moment on a Tuesday and a Friday we go to about 20 different homes and just, just distribute bread and food but the, in, the, the connections and the and the, um, the openings that that's provided for us from at least three of those households now, high school age uh, kids come along to our youth program and others are involved and connected in different ways. Um, so that's how we relate to the needy. And then the last one I've got here is how we relate to community leaders. You know, um, I, I, uh, over the years I've given a lot of importance to how I support, how I encourage, how I even at times go and speak to community leaders and um, even at times say to them, you know, uh, that, that I don't agree entirely with what they're doing or I just say, hey, could we do this a better way? But, but it's always, I think they always feel like I'm there and I'm behind them and I have their interests at heart. And so over the years, I've had great relationship with the general managers at the council and others who come and, and, and they, they often come and just talk to me about what I see, about different things that are happening within our community. Our state member, Steph Cook, is a beautiful uh, lady uh, who, uh, who represents our electorate in, at state parliament. And we've had significant relationship with her as she's asked us to be involved in different things, uh, some of it relating more recently to uh, dealing with domestic violence but other things. But she rang Mel, uh, Mel Beer. Many of you know Mel who works in our office at the church, um, a great asset for us. Um, she rang Mel the other day, about two weeks ago, and just wanted to ring her and just say, Mel, you know, I'm aware that you're doing these things in the community and I just want to tell you that I appreciate it. I know you fly under the radar, but I want you to know that I, I see it and I'm aware of it. Something like that, she said. What an encouragement that was uh, to us because um, we were just there wanting to encourage our community leaders, just wanting to sow into our community and to do the things that we do to lead people towards loving Jesus and experiencing the love of Jesus. Look, just to finish, um, as I was thinking about this particular session that I was going to take and so many thoughts were in my mind, so many things I could say, but one of the things I feel God really put on my heart to share was, um, was a short passage in Exodus 33. You'll be familiar with the passage. I don't need to unpack it too much. But I want to just read it to you and make a couple of final comments and then we'll finish up uh, for this session. And, and I just felt like the Lord just put this on my heart for this session to be able to share with you. And so I trust it will really speak in a relevant way to you. But Exodus 33, verses 12 to 17, I'll read it through quickly and then just point out a couple of things and we'll be done. I'm reading from the Amplified. Um, and it just says this, Exodus 33, 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you have found favour in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favour in your sight, let me know your ways so that I may know you, becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, recognising and understanding your ways more clearly and that I may find grace and favour in your sight, and consider also that this nation is your people. And the Lord said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest by bringing you and the people into the promised land. And Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with me, do not lead us up from here. And verse 16, this is probably the key verse, and I'd love you to think about it. For how then can it be known that your people and I have found favour in your sight. Is it not by your going with us, so that we are distinguished, your people and I, from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing that you have asked, for you have found favour, loving kindness and mercy in my sight, and I have known you personally by name. You see that verse 16, it says, 
Moses says, how will they know that you are with us? How will they know that we have favour? Because we have favour with you. How will they know that, um, that uh, we are your people? How will they know that if you are not with us? There's something visible, isn't there, about knowing that we have God's favour. There's something visible that comes into our life and the way we live and respond to him when we know that he is with us always. There's something affects the way we live and the way we treat the people and the way we respond to situations, whether they're difficult or, or, or good situations. But there's a way we live our life responding to God's presence when we know that we have his favour, when we know that he is with us, when we know that we are his people, and what that will do is that will distinguish us, not make us better. It will just distinguish us. It will separate us. It will show that there's something different about us. Um, Charles Finney, uh, I remember reading something a long time ago and I tried to find the exact quote and I couldn't sort of put my finger on it. But he said something like this as he was talking to, to leaders or as a quote maybe that, he'd, he'd, uh, that was in a book that he'd spoken to leaders about. But he, but he said... Um, he said he gave this warning and he said don't just try and be like everyone else don't just try and fit in and be normal in you know as you do your ministry he said people need you to be different and he's talking about being salt and light not being salt that has no flavor not being light that's lost its brightness but actually being willing to be different and I know in our community, of course, we want to be relevant. In our community, we want to connect. In our community, we want to understand people. In our community, we don't want to be judgmental or you know, highlight the difference. But you know, when we love Jesus, when we live our life as a worshipful lifestyle that, that responds to Jesus and in every situation, then what happens is people see that we live life differently. The Bible says that we're not like those who have no hope, but there are many other things that people notice about us in those different scenarios that I shared about before. The way we relate to one another, the way we relate to the wider Christian community, the way we relate to those who we don't agree with, the way that we relate to those who don't like us or speak against us, the way we relate to the needy, the way we relate to community leaders, the way uh, that we relate to trouble and difficulties and challenges that we all experience as part of life. People are watching and seeing and they know there's something different about us and they want someone who can lead them to love Jesus. They want someone who's not just like them, but when they're in a situation where they need help, they want someone who they feel might have some connection to a supernatural being, to, to, to God himself, to, to the love of Jesus, so that we can then be able to lead them that way. I can't tell you so many stories about times when people in our community, you know, we do a lot more, perhaps as much anyway, uh, ministry into our community with people who are not in the church as people who are in the church. And I'm always careful to be faithful with those who God has entrusted to us and be a good pastor of those who are in our church. But also I'm mindful that we, we pastor the whole community, 5,000, we pastor them. And so, uh, you know, we get invited to go and help people in times of crisis and difficulty because I believe they sent that there's something about the presence of God that is with us. There's something about our connection to Jesus and to the love of Jesus. Um, just quickly to finish, what about Joseph? What a great story. I can never get tired of talking about Joseph. But you know, he'd gone through all that injustice and whatever, and then he came to Potiphar's house, and Potiphar says, you know, he saw, or the Bible tells us that Potiphar saw that God was with him and he prospered in all that he did. Well, I tell you, how... Uh, I don't know how you see that when he's been rejected by his family, threatened to die. They spared him and sold him as a slave. Here he is in Potiphar's house. But what Potiphar sees is that he's not smelling like someone who's been through the fire, but he's actually appearing as somebody who has something of the touch of God and the favour of God and the presence of God upon his life. Then what happens is the injustice with Potiphar's wife, he goes to prison and it also says that the prison guard saw or the prison keeper saw that God was with him and that he prospered in all that he did. And so um, he was given lots of responsibility in the prison. Joseph is a wonderful example of how uh, his, his connection to the, 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 the purposes of God and his understanding of the purposes of God in his life and his trust that he had, you know, if we want to be leaders that bring our community or lead our community to experience uh, the love of God, to actually love God and come into loving Jesus, then I believe the key is for us 
to have a lifestyle of worship, being aware of his presence and, and responding to his presence in every situation that we face. Um, I trust that uh, those words are helpful for us um, and, and that you can apply that. I pray that you know, you'll be able to apply that to your own community and that the things I've said will be helpful and practical for you. It's such an honour to share with you. Um, enjoy the remainder of the conference. Only a little bit of time to go, but hasn't it been great? Um, may it finish well tonight and uh, may you just go home to your different churches and whatever with uh, feeling equipped and encouraged and inspired to be able to lead your families, lead your communities um, to, uh, to love Jesus and experience his love. May God bless you. Thanks so much.